Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, again. There we have some beefies. Hello, beefies. Yes, look at you. And there are a lot of beefies, and you can see that they're looking a little nervous. This is on account of the fact that there seems to be something akin to a tornado slash hurricane slash typhoon coming up behind us. And, uh, well, I didn't think it was going to hit us because I thought the wind was blowing in an opposite direction. And, uh, well, it might be. I'm still getting spatterings of rain. Anyway, there's a very relaxed herd of buffalo. They, of course, are not migrators. They do not like to migrate to the great herds of wildebeest, zebra, Thompson's gazelles, and elant. They are sedentary. Focus. Sedentary, I tell you. You believe me. Good, thank you. This pleases me to be believed. Other than that, they are possibly hunkering down. They may well know something about the weather that we do not. This would not be difficult, of course. There is a 78% chance of rain in this area, but of course, that is a fairly meaningless thing to say because the rain here is so isolated. Which means that unless you know, uh, it can rain in a patch as big as these buffalo and then not anywhere around them, if you know what I mean. So although there is definitely going to be and is indeed rain around here at the moment, you will find that it's very isolated and localized rain. Hello, Steph. Apparently you say that this is very impressive. I think, uh, as Kirsten says, you're talking about the buffalo and not the rain. It is rather impressive, I must say. Now, I don't know if we can actually see this, but the buffalo are surrounded by oxpeckers some of the time, but also starlings. And you find that starlings actually sit on the buffalo. They look like wattled starlings to me, and I think that's probably what we have. And they fly around onto the buffalo, obviously, perhaps, well, I don't know what they're obviously doing. They might just be hitching a ride and then leaping down to grab the invertebrates out of the grass, of which there must be many on a grassland like this. There, yeah, well, that is an ox peccar, though. Yes, it is an ox peccar, that one. You can see the culms of Thermida triandra wafting in the wind there. And uh, as always, my uh, biological teacher of the ether, uh, Judy H., sent me a little note on the name of Thermida triandra, which is the red oat grass we're looking at there. Thermida, uh, the triandra, comes from the fact that there are four spikelets on each culm. Uh, I'll try and show you what that means if I can get close enough to one to actually pick it. Uh, three of which, at least two of which, no, three of which apparently are male and one is bisexual. Isn't that amazing? So it refers to the three male. This was a bit sexist, really. Three male spikelets. There are four spikelets. Three of them will be male. One of them will be bisexual. Isn't that amazing, Fergus? Yes, you didn't know that, did you? I no, I didn't either until Judy H told me. Now, we don't have an enormous amount of time out here before we'll have to be back home, so I'm going to suggest, if nobody objects terribly strongly, that we move along towards the crossing points, because uh, I haven't been back to them this year at all, and I would quite like to get there and just have a look-see. Uh, if you're wondering what this device is, uh, may I suggest you tweet Jean-Dre. You can't tweet him, unfortunately, because he doesn't have a Twitter account, but it is some form of gimbal that we're going to mount a night camera on. Seems to be performing quite well, so that's good. Francis, you're in Israel, and you say, why do some animals migrate and why do some not? Well, it's just to do with the ecological niche that they happen to fill. And it's easy to tell you why the carnivores don't migrate. They don't migrate because their youngsters, of course, are, grow very much slower than the youngsters of, for example, wildebeest and uh, 
or any of the antelope species and the gazelles which can run almost from birth. Uh, the young of the carnivores can't. Why can't the young of the carnivores, why do they develop so slowly? Well, because of their strategy, because they cannot afford to be in utero for nearly as long, they are born much smaller, much more altricial, and, and so that's why they, why they don't migrate. One second. Amari. Uh -uh. They told me about it, but I'm afraid I haven't seen it. No. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. The tree is a leopard, by the way. I was told about a leopard in this area, but I couldn't see it, and I wanted to go to the crossings. Um, what was I going on about? Oh, yes, so that's why the carnivores don't migrate. Why don't buffalo migrate? Well, they don't have to. They are bulk grazers who are able to eat very dry grass. That means they don't have to follow the rain. They have a digestive system able to cope with the dry grass. Why do wildebeest migrate? Well, they don't have a digestive system that can cope with the dry grass. They don't need one because they can run, which means that although they have to expend energy moving and although their physiology is different, they have a source of food that enables them to do that. The buffalo have a probably slightly physiologically less expensive digestive system that allows them to stay in one place so they don't need quite as much energy. And there will be variations of those uh, throughout. Some animals do migrate all the time, some don't. Uh, you know that there are wildebeest in southern Africa that can stay put. Elephants in some areas will move huge distances, especially in a place like Botswana. If there is wind noise, I apologize. And so it just really depends on where they live. Some can cope with it, some can't, some have to, some don't, some have a mixture of the two. Let's have a look at these elephants before my head blows clean off my shoulders. Focus, I didn't want my head to blow off my shoulders. It's so unpleasant. There are some elephants. I'm just going to go the other side of the road, actually, because there's a car coming. Oh dear, the steering's locked. This is catastrophic. <laughs> Hang on. There we go. We're okay. Look at the very odd shaped tusks on that one there. That one, yes, well done. I do find that the tusks of the elephants here tend to be much thinner than the ones in Kruger. I'm not sure why that should be. Could easily be because the thick ones were shot out during the 19th century by those what we termed early conservationists, naturalists, aka butchers of the wilderness. Fergus, distressingly, the wind seems to... No, no, it's still blowing away from us into our faces. That's good. And I'm sorry the wind is loud, everybody. I'll try and... ...coming at quite a speed behind us. Uh, Kirsten, is it raining at home yet? No, I can see home. It's not raining there. Now, there's a much... There's a very large cow to the right hand side and she's talking to the cow in front I think. Also odd shaped tusks. Okay, I believe you're getting some black screen from us at the moment. We're going to head across back to Tristan now and try and sort out that signal issue.